Welcome, welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's really, yeah, I feel always, but it's really nice to be here this evening. Transitions are hard, who knows that? <laughs> and um, the transition sometimes to fall for some of us can feel like a little bit of a downer bummer. And uh, yeah, it's just so nice to be able to gather and feel kind of the coziness of what the fall does do. I feel like I'm kind of like a strung out too much sugar end of night kid at the end of summer. Like I'm just like, no more, like I want to stay up. And, and the fall kind of helps me actually turn inward and rest and like gather. And um, so I'm trying to lean into that opportunity and coming here and knowing that it'll get darker and darker when we come here and such a different feeling um, feels nice. And we're making our way towards Dia de los Muertos, which for folks who haven't been with our community, um, we've been really fortunate to have um, a community altar with the Dharma Collective for the last couple of years. And it's been so beautiful. A lot of folks in this room have helped out. We're definitely gonna do it again. Um, seeking visionary artist lead. Um, <laughs> we've had some pretty amazing visionary artist leads and I know uh, there's a lot of talent in this room. So if you're interested, please let us know. Daniel and I are trying to gather some forces to make it happen. So we can talk about that. And tonight we're gonna return to two things that came up last week. And if you weren't here, no problem. And these two topics are around Vedana or feeling tone. So how do we work with the experience of things that we attribute to being pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral? And it's, it's like the deeper you get into Vedana, I feel as though the bigger it becomes of a topic and a subject. Like it touches so many parts of our practice, especially when you think of that our practice isn't just a concept. Our practice is how we live our life. And I noticed for myself, right, even like turning down onto 24th and seeing the beautiful flags, and it's like, oh, pleasant, right? And then, <clears throat> and then, <laughs> you know, like car door open, swung open, like really unpleasant, right? And just how quickly the stimulus from all of our senses is offering up experiences that our mind so quickly can contract around or kind of get graspy around, like moving away from it, moving towards it. And seeing that clearly, like seeing that clearly by being in the moment is so much of the spiritual path. So much of our freedom lies in that ability to notice when we're contracting and notice when we're grasping. You can even forget about like stopping the grasping or the contracting. But just noticing that, as I mentioned last week, that meta awareness to recognize that we're kind of, you know, hijacked or in a trance by these temporary feelings and responses to the world, whew, it buys us a lot of freedom, a lot of freedom. So we'll be talking about uh, Vedana and, and also, you know, talking about bodhicitta, which we're talking about every night because this is the guide to the bodhisattva way of life. It's the text that we're moving through. Again, no problem if you have never even been here before. Welcome, so happy to have you. Um, and this text is so beautiful and over and over and over reminding us that all of this mind training we're doing, all of this forging of the heart is for the explicit purpose to wake up for the sake of all beings. And it's an impossible ask at the same time. And I was listening in the last couple of weeks, a teacher who I love, Sokni Rinpoche, was giving a retreat and he streamed it online and there was recordings available. So I was kind of having a little bit of Sokni Rinpoche in my everyday life. And he said something about bodhicitta that I've heard before and I might've even said here before, but it, it struck me so deeply, um, which is this idea of our aspiration to wake up for all beings, our aspiration to liberate all beings, it can sound so enormous, so difficult and so challenging. But one way of looking at it 
is when we are on this bodhisattva path, when we take the vow that, yes, I am here, I'm going to dedicate myself to liberate all beings. What that can also mean is I'm going to be available to see the goodness that is intrinsically in others and then help them see it. just really love that, right? Because it is, you know, when you're not in a rush and you have some space and you feel resourced, to see the goodness in others is one of the most um, meaningful things we experience in life, period. Such a big contributor to our well-being, to our health, to our feeling of joy. And to be able to really see with those eyes of bodhicitta, it's not just seeing the goodness and rejoicing in it, it's like, how can I help you see it? Oof, really beautiful. So I'd like us to kind of <clears throat> hold that as part of the vow tonight. So I'm going to do a little bit of description again in Vedana. We'll do a practice, some questions uh, or reflections, and then we'll get into um, this part, which I love, of uh, taming the mind. That's the chapter we're on now really about the first paramita, or spiritual quality of discipline. Nobody's favorite, because it doesn't sound very fun, but I assure you that this is discipline that we apply to the mind, and a way of kind of, as Shanti Deva says, tethering the mind so that it, like a wild elephant, won't kind of tramp all over everything and kind of destroy, as he describes so beautifully, the very the very kind of ingredients of our own well-being, right? Our mind is so kind of wild and blind and often so kind of captured by that craving and aversion that it tramples right over the very sources of our own well-being, um, which just feels so true sometimes. So that's, um, that's what we'll be getting into tonight. And just as a kind of opener, if you haven't been here before, <clears throat> I'm Eve. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And collective is a really important point here. It's an entirely volunteer-run center. And we're very fortunate to have a real community here of folks who volunteer and folks who show up and share their experience, which is what makes coming here, I think, so valuable and beautiful. So a reminder that each person who is here is an unbelievably valuable part of this evening's wisdom, this evening's compassion. And as such, there's a responsibility, right? Like showing up tonight means you are part of a community and a community in which the kind of basic essence is care, kindness. So that when we're listening, when we're speaking, when we're engaging with one another here, that's actually the real practice, right? bringing kindness to our entire way of being, our conduct, um, even our, our seeing. I keep joking with you all, but I'm going to keep saying that just like really see each other as Buddhas. Like I love that instruction. Whenever a teacher says that to me, it's like, right, like that's a possibility. And that has that essence of the bodhicitta, right? Seeing others in their intrinsic goodness not as though everybody here is acting all the time <laughs> in the most enlightened ways, but we see the seed potential in all of us. And when someone sees that in us, it actually potentiates our own ability to feel it in ourselves. So then we just create this awesome, you know, ref refractions of each other's light and care. So yeah, really happy to have you all here. And yeah, I want to say a word or two about Vedana, who had any pleasant experiences today? Yeah? Unpleasant? <laughs> yes, yeah. Neutral? Sometimes, yeah. But I really, I like, I love this question around Vedna, which is, was the experience actually pleasant or unpleasant? Like, what qualities of it were pleasant or unpleasant? Or is it our reaction to it? And I know there's some things that are like, no, that was just really unpleasant. And that can be kind of qualitatively, quantitatively true. But there, were there some things today that were unpleasant that were actually more about your mind imposing unpleasant? Any examples? Yeah. Thank you. Right. Well, you, 
We use we use the mic um, in order for folks online to hear. Just for. Well, I don't know. We'll we'll learn we'll learn soon enough. <laughs> it's on. Um, so there's a particular person at work. Um, I'm going to do this with right speech. Um, <laughs> that I I'm having a lot of I'm reactivity to. Yeah. And I did not encounter that person at work today, but I talked about that person at work. Hmm. And so there was. <laughs> oh, you just got it now. <laughs> and so, like, I created a lot of distress in my body. Hmm. Like, I became inc like I am stunned by how dysregulated I am by this hmm. person, and like how much. And I created that. Yeah. Completely. Right. So that was a created experience. Beautiful example. It did not need to happen. Clear seeing. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that's, you know, and it is obviously because <clears throat> most of there is a difference between feeling tone and emotion that we can get into if that feels right. But generally speaking, the majority of our emotions and our responses are catalyzed by other people. Right. That's a lot of what we're experiencing. And when we practice in meditation, those people show up. Right, like our thoughts and our, our kind of remembrances. So we get to work with even the feeling tone of our thoughts. But then in practice, we get more subtle and we can also notice just the feeling tone of pleasant, unpleasant and neutral for sensations in the body, sounds, and um, yeah, a whole variety of different experiences that go beyond just our thinking. Um, Someone mind? Oh yeah, you got it. Okay, sorry. Unpleasant experience. <laughs> Sometimes it switches on Zoom and it's like a huge me and I'm not that into it. But it's definitely a projection. Um, any, anyone else like a experience where there was a neutral or there was, I mean neutral is really interesting because neutrals often, we're not paying attention. Especially when we think of people, neutral people. It's often people we feel indifferent about. Like we don't have care. We don't have any sense of um, often like them as a full human. There's a lot of neutral. And that's not necessarily bad. But if we consider, which I'd love us to um, entertain this possibility, that our basic awareness, when we are paying attention, when we are aware, it is infused with bodhicitta then when someone is neutral, we're actually not paying attention, right? We're not, we're not paying attention. They aren't real to us. And thereby they don't exist, which actually is a little bit punishing, right? But then there can be a lot of like neutral experiences that if we paid a little closer attention might be pleasant. If we paid a little closer <laughs> attention might be unpleasant. You know, neutral isn't necessarily bad but very often it means checked out or dissociated so, any other examples folks have yes please i'm gonna continue on the work thing it's a work day <laughs> um, i have this regularly occurring meeting every week that i've been added to that i really don't need to be on <laughs> like consistently proven i don't really need to be there but um so it's a space to practice is this positive <laughs> or is it is it pleasant unpleasant or neutral yeah. and so today i think i felt all of those feelings yeah. during the same like period of time i went from being like this is unpleasant none of this pertains to how any way that there's you know and then there were a couple pleasant moments where i just you know got to see a couple people crack some jokes and it was like oh that's enjoyable okay yeah and then neutral in what you just described like i felt pleasant because i was disengaged from the conversation because it was like i can multitask while this is happening and yeah. so i'm questioning like is neutral really possible yeah because yeah neutral is just averting your attention elsewhere yeah so yeah no that's really clear noticing and it's so funny that specific thing of in a meeting you don't need to be in. Like that's a, it's a particular kind of like angst um, that can arise there. And sometimes it can feel like 
almost a form of disrespect, right? Like, why am I here? So it can elicit some difficult emotions. And it is interesting to kind of like track, and we can notice that these feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, especially in the context of, let's say, a meeting or so, like waiting in line, we feel it in the body. When we start to have an idea about it, it actually impacts our physiological response and system. So this isn't just, oh, well, who cares if I feel good or bad about this? No big deal. Why am I paying attention? Like, not only does it, you know, impact our perspective of the moment. So if it's too negative, right, if we're really like, I hate this, why am I here? This is so annoying. We might miss out on the jokes. So there was even some flexibility there, right, to not get stuck. And when we're looking at and trying to get super clear on Vedana, <clears throat> it's not in order to try to stop feeling pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. It's not possible. That's not going to happen. It is to try to get less hooked into a complete story around this is bad, this is good, and the way that that creates samsara, that creates our endless wandering away from ourselves and towards what we believe to be good and away from what we believe to be bad. <clears throat> and we think of samsara and it's like this big cycle, but it starts with these tiny moments. And this is, you know, meditation over and over and over again is paying attention to these micro experiences. That's what helps us see the bigger picture, right? So Vedana, you know, just for folks to understand it and situate it, it's part of the four foundations of mindfulness. So we did that together, some of us here, when we were reading Old Path, White Clouds, and just such an essential part of the Buddhist teachings applying mindfulness to the body and the breath, to feelings, to mind itself, right? These are these ways that we can start training our mind to really notice itself. <laughs> like noticing the body is a way of noticing the present moment because the body is here. And noticing feeling tone, noticing pleasant, unpleasant, is another way for us to be here, actually experiencing what's happening. And the reason I like Vedana practice so much, and I, I wanted us to focus on it for this chapter, is the emphasis and the thrust of this chapter on the paramita of discipline. It really asks us, how can we start taming the mind? How can we start not just being kind of pushed back and forth by the winds of the mind, right? by our desires, by our aversions, how can we actually start to observe more clearly when that's happening and return to peace, to calm? With practice, the goal isn't, I want to feel good, I want to just get to that pleasant, like that's the goal, like if I get that pleasant all the time. The goal is a flexible mind, a calm mind. And when I had the outrageous good fortune to work on this project for His Holiness the Dalai Lama, this Atlas of Emotion project, his whole goal of it was people need a map so they can understand the inner territory of their emotions, so they can return over and over and over to a calm mind. Not so they can be happy, right, but they can have a calm mind. And then, you know, the second beat of that uh, statement is, because a calm mind is where compassion naturally arises. You know, that's, that is not only a, um, you know, Buddhist idea, it's a, it's a well-researched, well-founded idea. It makes sense according to evolutionary psychology. Like, how would we have survived as a species if we didn't have this tendency towards social cohesion, care, connection? We cannot survive alone. We live in this outrageously uh, independent um, kind of illusion <laughs> that we really do live alone. We need each other, and naturally we care for each other. And we can also really be assholes. That's true too, right? It's not just one way. But when we have that mind that feels calm, that isn't being kind of tugged and pushed, like, man, this, there's a beautiful section in the reading tonight of kind of this, you know, just the pain of relentless desire, right? When we're not like pulled under by relentless desires, when we're not preoccupied with agitation and aversion, that calm mind is kind. So that's, you know, that's a bit of the goal with Vedana is to give us these micro experiences of watching how the mind gets captured. 
over and over and over and coming back. <clears throat> I do, I'm going to be honest, I find Vedna practice really boring. Um, <laughs> I'm probably not supposed to or something as a meditation teacher. And I do find it really gets the job done to settle my mind. So if, if your experience of it is like, oh my God, like this is boring. Like that's not everybody's experience. Anybody here like Vidna practice? Like it's your jam? Yes. Great. What do you like about it? The, the eventual fruits of it, which, which are, as you say, it allows me to, to settle and to sort of see how I get hooked yeah. by different stuff and how, how it changes all the time. <laughs> I mean, I live in a really quiet neighborhood, basically. And when I sit in the morning, it's pretty quiet unless there's some construction going on or something. Yeah. There usually isn't, so it's usually quiet. And my neighbors, a few houses away, have chickens. <laughs> and sometimes when I'm sitting, the chickens are making noise. And sometimes when the chickens are making noise, it's kind of pleasant. <laughs> and other times it's not. Mm. And sometimes I don't notice it at all until I do. And then I go, oh, the chickens have been going off for the last 10 minutes and I didn't even notice it. Right. So there's, there's all of that happens and it's the same stimulus. Yeah. And it's all landing in my mind and it's, it's all like that. And when there's construction in my neighborhood, at times the noise of it doesn't bother me. Hmm. But if I'm trying to take a nap in the afternoon, it really bothers me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 And sound has Vedna, Vedna practice. My early training with it was initially with was all the sense doors. You know, you, you got some smell, you have some textual feeling. And sound was a big one. Yeah. Sound is, is very easy to access during meditation. And so whatever ambient sounds were going on, were they pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? And it really kind of depended on how closely I was paying attention to them. Like you said before, yeah. if I wasn't paying real close attention, they were pretty neutral. If I, if, if I got caught by it, hooked by it, or at least my attention was drawn to it, it could be pleasant, mm. like a dog barking in the distance or something, or it could be unpleasant if it was somebody wheezing, like, you know, a couple of folks away from you or, <laughs> or whatever, you know. So it, yeah. But it's that, that, that repeated reminder that most of my pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral experience is really dependent on my state of mind yeah yeah more than it is and that doesn't only go for sound it also yeah. goes for you know the feelings that i have in my body if i'm in pain if i'm not in pain yeah I'm feeling comfortable or not <clears throat> comfortable if the cushion is just right or not or whatever it is yeah or if it's you know yeah what whatever stimulus it is including my own thoughts you know whether oh, they yeah. can you know be yeah. So it's really, it's informative. It's super, super informative. And that's what I like about this practice. Yeah. Yep. No, completely true. And I think on retreat, Vedana practice comes kind of exciting because nothing's happening. So <laughs> there's like more. And I, I remember once on retreat, um, I've never, no, never since and, and never before, but I actually felt an entire shiver come on. It was like a little cold in the morning. And I was like, this is ecstasy. <laughs> it was like, just because it was such a full experience, I was like, oh my God, like in your skin change and like just so rich. <clears throat> and so there's a way, you know, that attending closely, no problem with attending closely and discovering that, wow, like actually this, you know, this subtle part of my cheek, like not even touching it, but just feeling it is pleasant. It's not with Vedana practice, we have to ignore that maybe more things become pleasant with our attention. 
just to see clearly when we get a little hooked on them and try to let them move and pass through. Just like always, and, and Jimmy was saying this, it's, the sounds are such a good mode of practice because the sounds come and go, right? They arise and fall. And once they're gone, we're not like still thinking about that motorcycle, right? Like the motorcycle sound is gone. But we get really hooked often with like the sensations in our body or the thoughts. So we're gonna do a bit of that sense portal practice. We'll go through sensation, sound, a little bit of smell and taste, but there probably isn't a lot, uh, if we're lucky in this room right now. And then, uh, <laughs> and then we will go to, to mind. And, and mind is certainly tricky, being able to observe thoughts and notice the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral nature of them without getting hooked but we'll just keep trying. Truly a practice, laboratory experiment. So find a posture that works for you. Feel free to come into the hot lava pit if you want to. Really taking a moment to feel ourselves in this room. And for friends at home to really feel yourself in the space. And for all of us, just having that sense of connection with this natural world a sense of the quality of light and darkness outside. For us here in the Bay Area, this atmospheric support of the clouds kind of holding us in. Feeling ourselves on this land. This land which not only holds and supports us, but has held and supported so many. And as a way to prime our bodhicitta, <clears throat> just think of wherever you are, within five square blocks, how many beings are struggling, how many beings could use the love and compassion that we could generate in this practice. Here at the Dharma Collective, we're within five blocks of San Francisco General. Many folks living unsheltered. And allowing that to <clears throat> inspire the heart to apply ourselves to practice more fully recognizing the great need all around. And when we hear the sound of the bell, just inviting our attention and awareness to come fully in the body.
Taking a couple moments to notice what might be preventing us from fully arriving here. Thoughts or memories. All of the activity of the mind is incredible energy that we can use right back into our practice. So inviting all of the energy and movement of the mind to be fully given to attending closely to the sensations in the body. And right away, as we attend to the sensations in the body, we notice, apply our mindfulness and recognize Which of these sensations do I consider to be pleasant or unpleasant or some form of neutral? And so starting with the top of the crown of the head, is there any quality of sensation at the crown? Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral? Tend closely with curiosity. Moving this attention and awareness to the face. Bringing that curiosity to the quality of sensations between the brows and across the forehead. Through the eyes, the cheeks. And the jawbone. Maybe we immediately label it pleasant right around the eyes. But as we continue to pay attention, we just notice warmth or heaviness. Maybe something that feels initially unpleasant becomes less so. Without any expectation, without any preference of how it should be, Just continuing to notice with curiosity, sensations throughout the face. Wrapping around to the back of the head, the neck, the shoulders. And giving this new territory your full attention and awareness. And whenever the mind gets carried away and distracted, taking that moment to recognize the power of energy and attention has moved the mind. And invite that same energy and attention back to noticing the body. 
now noticing the chest and the belly and allowing the the sphere and the scope of our attention and awareness to widen to the entire body. Letting our attention and awareness follow where we experience sensations as they arise. Noticing once again, if we find them pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, watching them shift, change. So important with these practices of attention training that we keep the attention bright, but that we don't get too tight. So we're paying attention with this curiosity, this vividness of mind, not letting ourselves get too dull or carried away, and also not bearing down, not contracting. So just a couple moments more Noticing this sense portal of tactile sensation in the body and how we apply or even impose the pleasant, unpleasant and neutral attribution. And then shifting the focus of our attention and awareness to the sense portal of sound. Using our mindfulness to notice when sounds arise, pass away. Notice sounds that are more steady in the background. And see if we can notice immediately as our mind attributes some sounds to be pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And whether we can experience the sound as sound. Keep coming back and keep coming back whenever you get carried away, not making it a problem at all. Just finding and exercising that mindfulness, 
to return and as much as possible remain in this mindfulness of sound. And then shifting to the sense portal of thoughts and perception in the mind. This could feel a bit like a leaning back in the mind, an opening, allowing all those thoughts and memories and images a free reign to come, but also to go. And noticing the thoughts that arise. Do they feel pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? Can we remain unengaged, uninvolved, observing them come and go just like sounds coming and going? This can be quite subtle, but we are actually resting in awareness. And the thoughts, they come and go out of awareness. But awareness is not pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Awareness is vast, luminous spaciousness. It's like the sky from which the clouds never really change the surface. We just pass through. But can we rest in this awareness as we are observing the mind and the thoughts and formations that arise?
At some point, we may find ourselves more interested in the awareness than the comings and goings of the mind. We can find some brief respite, allowing ourselves to settle in awareness. Finding that stillness amid the movements of the mind. As we lean further and further into awareness, then all the sense portals are there. Sensations arise and perceived in the mind. Sounds arise, perceived in the mind. And of course, thoughts and memories and images. A constant array and parade of experiences through the sense portals. And inviting this resting spaciousness of awareness, even amid all the comings and goings, preferences and judgments. We consider this possibility that the very nature, the very fabric of our awareness is already bodhicitta, loving awareness, loving presence, without object, just this essential nature of our being. If we can hold within this loving awareness, this clear light awareness, 
the experiences of our senses, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. We can hold within our loving awareness all the joys and all the sorrows without becoming detached, and without becoming overwhelmed. Just feel and imagine the possibility of boundless loving awareness. And when the bell rings, you don't have to go anywhere. Stay right here with whatever glimpse or hint of loving awareness is present or manifest. Thank you for your practice. Hmm. Before we move into reflecting and describing, just noticing whatever is present here. And it would be wonderful to hear <clears throat> from some folks any questions or reflections and an invitation of our mindful speech to be pithy. And then we can hear from as many people as possible who would like to share or ask a question. So. I think, what does my teacher say? Sentences, not paragraphs. I like that, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Kirby, he, him. Um, something I noticed with the practice today was going through the, the characteristics of the different sense doors. And what I find very fascinating is when I do this practice, if I, when I get to the sense door of the thoughts, if mm. I'm able to pay attention to that sense door, the thoughts just don't arise. They just kind of stop. Whereas with sounds or smells or other sense doors, like there's a stream of new observations that occur. Yeah. With with the thoughts in store, if you actually pay attention to it, um, yeah, just the thoughts stop arising. Um, yeah, and there, there's something about when you are observing the other senses, there, there's kind of a ups and downs of pleasantness and unpleasantness, mm -hmm. but with thoughts, if you're able to actually continue placing awareness on that sense door, then it's just, it feels rather either pleasant or kind of like that the concept of like emptiness is what I think of which is mm. like it's just like a it's like a very light kind of blissful feeling kind of feeling. that's wonderful not always true so that's a great yeah and I'm curious when you say like 
no thoughts, do they, do they start coming back at all? Because very often, right when we check them out, they do kind of run away, you know, yeah. they kind of like, like, yeah, I use the bad metaphor of like, you turn on the lights and the cockroaches in your apartment are like, Wee! you know, it's a New York City joke, but um, yeah, like that kind of experience, but then they come back out or do they come back, the thoughts? Yeah, I, I did a practice once where it was kind of the idea of being like a, a gatekeeper mm -hmm. and watching anyone go through the gate is like the thoughts. But it kind of feels like if you look away from the, the gate, yeah. then the thoughts will come back. Yeah. But if you're like, if you keep really, like really focusing, concentrating on the gate, like they don't seem to like come or go. Yeah. Actually. That's but wonderful. It, but it's kind of easy to like lose, you know, like yes. to focus on it. Yeah. Like that, that's, that usually happens. Though. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, yeah, it's a, a wonderful experience to have. And then, were you able to experience awareness? Yeah, just kind of, I feel like, especially with the, when you're able to focus on the, the gate of thoughts, mm -hmm. then it, when you have that kind of like emptiness of experience, it feels like you're in that pure state of awareness. Mm -hmm. And then I guess actually my thoughts did come back because I started thinking like, well, if bodhicitta is when you're in a state of pure awareness, and when you're in pure awareness, the thoughts aren't there. What does that say about the thoughts? Yeah, <laughs> it's a good question. I got lost in that. There you go. Brain. Good. Yeah. The mind is very tricky, but that's yeah. but that's like an insight inquiry. Like those are yeah. really good questions. And sometimes, you know, when no thoughts are coming, you'll even propagate a thought just to be able to recognize mind. Like, I mean, you it doesn't sound like that was totally intentional, but you could even the thought of this is the mind. Right, then you're like, where did that come, where does it go? Just so you can like watch and observe, so. Yeah, thanks. Other, oh, I see a, a hand. Yes, please, <laughs> you. And then we'll do, I think I saw one online too. Um, so I had kind of a similar thing when we like turned to the thoughts, I was like, oh, <coughs> nothing here. Uh, and it just kind of—I was doing sort of a stage thing. Yeah. So I was—I felt like I was in a theater waiting for something to turn on, and like nothing was coming. Um, but I did feel during that when there was like no thoughts happening, supposedly, um, I had like a really big emotion. Mm. And it made me think, like, since I'm not having thoughts. <laughs> mm hmm. Is this emotion just pre-existing, like in the body, mm. and then like whatever thoughts did start to come through, would that be like superposed onto that thought, or if like, am I just so focused on seeing the thought that like there may be existing somewhere in a a green room of mm. sorts mm. that um, <laughs> I'm uh, not seeing? So I think that's what I started after that. I was like, wait. If I'm having this emotion already, and I have this emotion's like familiar to me, especially as of like late, mm. so I was like maybe this is just me right now. So the things, because mm. I did read, I I read something a long time ago in a book about like it's called like neurodharma. So I don't know if anyone's familiar. By Rick with Hansen. That. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, he talked about how the loom, it, your mind is a loom, and it weaves something and like whatever comes out so it kind of made me think of like my loom just being having this emotion mm. and yeah so i don't know i don't know if that was a question or I, it was a great reflection okay. <laughs> and i think and there doesn't need to be a question you know and i think in general just that kind of close attention to the mind it's just so much better than anything i'll ever tell you right like really like observing and noticing like whoa Sometimes I feel emotions without thoughts. Like, oh, it just gives us a more dimensional understanding of mind and awareness, which is kind of crazy. We don't spend all our time thinking about this and like observing it because that's like everything. And, you know, there's so much theory and science and research on emotion. And luckily, like, you're the expert on it and your own observation of it is far more refined than any mechanism we have to observe it, anything we do. So I'd say to really like be curious and keep being curious. And I think, you know, especially 
depending on our um, kind of, we might be in an ongoing state of a certain emotion, whether that's anxiety or loneliness or frustration. And there's kind of like a, you know, like a, uh, a pathway we are treading for a while and, and then often it changes. And again, there's no problem but being able to be with it. And I was just writing, um, writing up some data today about like the, we always want to say that the goal is again, like feeling happy, but really like the goal is richness of being able to identify all of your emotions. Like that's power. So um, yeah, great observing. And when the emotion came, how was that in your practice? Uh, I didn't love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not my fave. Yeah. But um, I think I knew that about myself already. Yeah. And also, like, to have emotions um, in a crowded room, also not my fave. So yeah. I think I just knew that already. And I was like, I, I think your statements on, like, judgment was, like, a great walk on yeah. to, like, something like that. And yeah. Like, very helpful. Good. Yeah. And, you know, when emotions arise in practice, it's, it is like a form of exposure therapy, right? <laughs> and if we can hold ourselves it, with it, then we're holding ourselves like, you know, with integrity and beauty and like that loving presence and not fixing or changing or planning around it. So, yeah. Thank you. I see a hand online. This is Victor, and uh, well, uh, today I have a couple unpleasant experiences, nothing really major, but I decided to talk about them because when I experienced them, I... You know, Victor, we, we can't hear you very well, so it's it's actually hard. It's a little garbled. Um, okay. and, and remember pithy. We're going to keep it brief. Okay. Uh, let someone else talk. Okay, yeah, sorry, we really, it's just like kind of garbled, so not so. Any other, yes, please. I have a question. Yeah. Around Vedana itself. Yes. Um, feeling tone, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> and also, like, is it the sensation, the feeling of the feeling, or our perception of the feeling, yeah. slash also both? Yeah, I think maybe slash both, but definitely more the perception yeah. of the feeling. And that's what makes it so um, potentially revolutionary or like this unlocking factor because we can start, like I had such awesome material for this. Like all of a sudden my knee started hurting so bad, but we were on hearing and I'm like, no, like we're not on the body anymore. <laughs> I can't pay attention. And then it like went away because I wasn't focusing on like something's wrong, something's wrong. So we can really notice that that attribution of really don't like it, really don't like it can perpetuate the experience, right? And get us more hooked or get us more um, contracted. So that feeling tone, you know, really identifying that attribution. And then, you know, there's um, one teaching I was listening to earlier this week on, on Vedana was seeing it actually as our hindrances too, like seeing it as whenever, you know, any form of Vedana, which I feel like I was like, I'm not going to talk about that. It's too complicated, but here I am. Um, this idea that the way that we're imposing our view upon experience leads to all of our aggression and all of our ignorance and all of our craving. So it's really, it's, it's, it's kind of just our perception, but also that's a habit and something that we can identify as a pattern. And once we identify those patterns, then hopefully, I mean, this is a, there's an interesting passage in tonight's practice around kleshas or these difficult or defiled emotions um, in Tibetan. And this idea that the more clearly we see them, the more possibility and potential they have to lose their power. And so it's interesting, like Vedana is like the clear seeing power that allows us to kind of not get so hooked. And in the way that Pema Chodron talks about it in this text, she says, it's like recognizing we're in a dream 
and just waking up from the dream. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Gladys. Thank you. So maybe a question related to that. Yeah. Um, and since we are on the topic of Vedna, can you clarify the fourth pillar of foundation of mindfulness on mental formations? Yeah. So what's the difference between mind? Our thoughts and emotions. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because like, yeah, so we got body. Oh, yes. The difference between mental formations and thoughts and emotions. Yeah. Because yeah. so in the four foundations of mindfulness, we're kind of applying our mindfulness to these different experiences. And with Vedana, the feeling tone is different than applying. I mean, we actually we went to the fourth application of mindfulness in this practice, right? Because we observed the mind and observed thoughts. And then we just were in the observation. And that's often where we get in that fourth foundation. It doesn't go so far. So it's like, you know, awareness of thoughts, but not usually awareness of awareness that starts getting more into like Dzogchen practice. Um, but in the fourth foundation, I'm sorry if this is wonky for some people, but no problem. Um, it is interesting to notice the different subtlety of like observing how we judge and or prefer this aspect of our sensory experience, which is Vedana, and then being able to observe like these kind of entire experiences of mind, which usually are more like thoughts and a little bit less like pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. But it does like overlap when it comes to thought. But it's interesting, I mentioned this last week with there's a lot of teachers of, in Vedana and they'll just focus on body, like really just focus on body and like that's Vedana. And then you'll have like all these other, especially in the um, insight tradition, be like, you're not really teaching Vedana. If you're only teaching body, like you're missing out. So I think there's some conflict. And I wonder if part of it is it's it really confusing when you're teaching it also as thoughts and other sensory experiences. Um, and, you know, the long and short of it is as long as you're developing awareness for phenomena arising <laughs> in the body and the mind, who cares? I mean, it doesn't matter, you know. But I do think, you know, just like we heard, and will you remind me your name again? Jessica. Jessica, as Jessica was describing, like, just that subtlety of noticing is so rich and valuable. So we want to keep like that, that like granularity of what is this quality of mind. Um, and if we do that by noticing feeling tone, or if we do that by noticing entire mental formation, great. Yeah. Thanks, Gladys. So let's move on to the text a little, because I have some questions for you with this text. Um, we're still in chapter four. We are, but we only have two more pages in chapter four. Then we're going to go on to chapter five tonight. Yep. So the, uh, let's see here. So, <laughs> uh, I just, <laughs> That's why I just love his drama. Um, so you might remember, um, I think what is the, the one I love in this chapter so much, the, therefore, if these long lived ancient enemies of mine, the wellspring of only increasing woe can find their lodging safe within my heart, what joy or peace in this world can be found? So this, you know, really looking at recognizing that one of our biggest obstacles and sources of distress and difficulty are our own emotions, right? Which live in our own heart and our own mind. And then, um, yeah, then there's this kind of like shift. So he goes on for kind of stanza after stanza. And for folks who haven't been here before, Shanti Deva is an eighth century Indian scholar, kind of did this beautiful text has been beloved by many teachers and this commentary secondary commentary is by Pem Pema Chodron who also loves this text um, and this idea that you know if the source of all our difficulty pain and suffering so much of it is in you know our own hearts with these kleshas or difficult emotions then there's good news if that's in our own heart then well we can work with that 
So he kind of like turns a little here. And as Pema says, happiness comes with knowing that once our difficult emotions are uprooted by the eye of wisdom, by seeing them clearly, they can never return. Their power evaporates once we see their empty ephemeral nature. And I like what you were saying, Kirby, like recognizing whatever it is that I'm feeling, it's not truly real. Like this is an imposition. Like I'm just creating this uh, experience and it will actually pass. Um, and there's a beautiful story here. So Zigar Kontrol Rinpoche says that um, being able to see clearly the ephemeral and kind of um, insubstantial nature of our difficult emotions is like when the youngest monks in his monastery would be very afraid by the annual snow lion dance. So, right, like, so this big, you know, lion that comes through and all the kids are like, oh my God, I'm so scared, even though it's, it's a puppet, right? And then when they got older and realized a snow lion wasn't real, it's just a puppet, that it was just a costume, they lost their fear. So if we can have, if we can kind of see our difficult defiled emotions as like a snow lion, like it's just a costume, it's just something that's being kind of spun up by the mind, then we can become free. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to work very well, right? Because we have these insights and we're like, oh, wow, I can't believe I felt so insecure for like that whole afternoon. Like, that's not me. And then two days later, we're like <laughs> feeling it again. So I don't know how many times we have to bring this like eye of clear seeing wisdom to our emotions for it to really stick. Like, this is going to pass. This isn't totally true. Like, this is just part of your experience. Um, and then the next part uh, that I love here, yeah, the way that she closes this chapter, the end of chapter four, which is the final stanza. They are simple mirages, so take heart, these difficult emotions. Banish all your fear and strive to know their nature. Why suffer needlessly in the pains of hell? This is how I should reflect and labor, taking up the precepts just set forth. What invalid in need of medicine ignored his doctor's words and gained his health? So this idea that if we really recognize the these kleshas or difficult emotions are within our own heart. If we can recognize their nature as insubstantial, we have the medicine, right? And who would, you know, reflect on, like if a doctor gave you a prescription, like this will make you totally healthy and you don't take it, like, you're not gonna get better. So the prescription here is recognize, see clearly the insubstantial nature of emotion. That is what's gonna get you free. And she says, just as a sick person won't get well without following their doctor's orders, we won't be helped by these teachings unless we put them into practice. This is not academic study. We have to, if we are not practicing daily, we are strengthening our kleshas. These teachings are a way of life. To awaken bodhicitta, nurture it and have it flourish. You have to take these words personally and use them whenever you find yourself getting hooked and carried away. So, you know, I, I appreciate that idea that <laughs> these can't just be concepts or recognitions that, yes, emotions kind of will drag us through. We actually have to start recognizing right in the moment. And it's, you know, we have so many opportunities all day long to have that experience of seeing how our emotions make us like literally temporarily lose our mind, forget who we are and often forget our true nature, right? Forget if we have even the slightest inkling that our, our true nature, our awareness is loving presence. Does anybody feel that in the practice a little bit? Like if that, if you feel it, that's who you are. So how do you kind of sustain and return and sustain and return so that it stops becoming this kind of back and forth and more like mm, the everyday experience. And I, I do think, you know, over time, we start to have more of that, but often we're so much also more poignantly aware of when we fall away, that we cannot experience it as progress, 
but I really invite folks in this room, especially many of you I know are practicing and applying yourselves to, to notice like the momentum where you do feel a little less hooked, just a little, It'd be very encouraging. So then in this chapter, this next chapter here, we get into the paramitas. Some of you might be familiar. These are, you know, just really beautiful. I think of them as like spiritual technology. You know, they're tools to help us wake up, practices that really can um, support us. And these paramitas, the first one here we're starting with is discipline. And it really has to do with the way that we are in the world, the way that we're behaving, the way that we're acting, the way that we're uh, communicating. And that in order for us to practice discipline, we're, we're, you know, when we practice discipline, we're preventing future harm. Because if we think of this law of karma, every single moment we are sowing the seed of the karma that will ripen in the future. You know, if you believe in it, this could be, you know, ripening through lifetimes. But if you don't have a sense of a spiritual practice, you know that if you're, you know, no offense, Mace, gossiping, right? That is planting a seed for future, like, suffering, right? Because whoever you were talking to, then they're going to gossip. Like, right, we see that. And the discipline is the discipline of how profoundly non-harming can I be in body, speech, and mind, in everything I'm doing. And, man, I think I remember last week, Victor was telling us that he watched the debate and he didn't say any negative commentary. A very good uh, example of a lot of discipline I did not share. I got all the memes and laughed a lot. Um, but it's really this idea that it's so important for us to at least have the choice. Like it's one thing to, you know, decide to gossip or decide to do something that may actually increase your, your challenges, your stress, your difficulty or dysregulation over time. But it's another to not even be aware you're falling into that habit. You know, so can we bring that discipline of training the mind to recognize when we fall away? So the stanza, um, this one, first one in chapter five is, those who wish to keep a rule of life must guard their minds in perfect self-possession. Without this guard upon the mind, no discipline can ever be maintained. So Kirby, very much like your analogy there. And the method for calming the mind, you've, some of you have heard this um, from me before in other places, but this idea of, of shamatha or attention training and often actually translated as calm abiding. And we're practicing shamatha all the time. Shamatha is when we're applying any kind of attention practice. So mindfulness of the body, the four foundations are all shamatha practices. It's a way of um, helping us start to become aware of not only when the mind is present, but when the mind drifts away. Say that's depending on the tradition of meditation, like 50 to 75 percent of meditation, right? These shamatha practices. In addition, we have the visualization practices, the heart practices, the vipassana practices, or inquiry or insight. But with this paramita of discipline, the shamatha is so important, this training of the mind. Um, so Pema says here, when the mind is wild, we have no foundation for maintaining discipline. Specifically, the three disciplines of not causing harm, gathering virtue, and benefiting others. How can we work with these difficult emotions, or speak with kindness, or reach out to others if our mind is crazed? Without the stability and alertness of a tamed mind, how can we be present? Therefore, mindfully, gently, and repeatedly, we train in coming back. And, you know, I, I love that. Um, I always think of the discipline of non-harming, but I love that she also says gathering virtue and benefiting others, right? So the non-harming of, you know, our own body, speech, and mind, and then how can we also be intending towards the gathering of virtue or kind of um, cultivating the mind into these benevolent states, altruism, empathy, care, kindness, and benefiting others. So the discipline even of noticing and being available to supporting others. And she says, taming the mind takes time. 
Thank God, that's true. Uh, through good and bad moods, through periods of peacefulness, and when we get overwhelmed by difficult emotions, we, we train in being present day by day, month by month. And, you know, this idea that hopefully many of you have heard many times, but it's important to hear many, many more times, the practice isn't about never getting distracted, never, you know, straying away from the present moment. It's about training and coming back over and over and over. The discipline is coming back, coming back. And um, I love this stanza. This is probably one of the most famous in the book. Wandering where it will, the elephant of the mind will bring us down to the pains of deepest hell. <laughs> no worldly beast, however wild, could bring upon us such calamities, right? The wild elephant of the mind. Yeah, I mean, who has experienced a wild elephant of the mind in the last week or so? I mean, it's insane that we don't have control over our own mind. Um, <laughs> it's just so funny. And then we're like going about society and having jobs and relationships. <laughs> and like, it's like, it's like, it's like this open secret we never talk about. <laughs> it's very awkward. Um, and he says, if with mindfulness's rope, the elephant of the mind is tethered all around, our fears will come to nothing. Every virtue drop into our hands. So if this wild elephant of the mind that is, you know, so likely to, gonna succumb to anxieties, insecurities, frustrations, blame, if we can like really notice our mind, if we can be, you know, at the gateway of our mind, noticing what's happening, we can reduce our suffering a lot. And I don't know if we can totally get rid of our, all our fears, but this idea that once we can pay like close attention to what's happening in the mind, we don't even have to try to create virtue, like kindness and compassion will naturally arise, a calm state of mind. I find it so encouraging. So she says, Pema says, cultivating the mind's inherent capacity to stay put is mindfulness. It's like the rope that keeps the wild elephant from destroying everything in its sight. The rope of mindfulness brings us back to our immediate experience, our breath, our walking, to our reading. The point is essential. Mindfulness tethers the mind to the present. And this takes effort, but over time, you actually become natural at coming back. It's no big deal. By gently returning to the present, all our fears come to nothing. Every virtue drops in hand. And this, you know, classic Pema Chodron's teacher, um, Chogyam Trimpa, very famously said, everything is workable. And everything is workable when we train the mind. Um, and then I want to, I think we're going to have to come back to some of this next week, but I want to read this stanza, which is, uh, the idea that like the part, so there's the six paramitas in certain traditions, there's eight or 10, but six paramitas here, generosity, discipline, patience, enthusiasm, meditation, and wisdom. And they all kind of help tame the mind and transform the mind at the same time. And she says that until we work with the mind, the paramitas actually can't liberate us. Like, doesn't matter how much we are trying to understand conceptually discipline or generosity, unless our mind can keep coming back and remembering these qualities, it's going to be impossible. And she says, this is because the paramitas and letting go of self clinging are the same. So like one of those lines where I'm like, what? She just dropped such a huge, you know, teaching there is, taming the mind and part of taming the mind and being able to kind of generate these um, positive states is really being able to loosen our self-obsession. And what helps us loosen our self-obsession? Remembering that we are here for the sake of all beings, you know? So it's, it seems like a selfish way to approach bodhicitta, like, oh, gosh, it'll actually help me tame my mind to think about others that's okay, like no problem, no, it's not cheating. And in fact, again, like these, all of these practices, they are like these technologies. It is part of our human nature to kind of get self-focused. 
Is it more common in our contemporary culture? I think so, but it's always been true. It's very easy to feel like we are the center of the show, right? And this idea of kind of extending and expanding our heart to include all beings, like that richness allows these qualities to, to grow and thrive. And so to pay attention, and my invitation to all of us is to pay attention when we get carried away, when the wild elephant of the mind is trampling around, who are you focusing on, <laughs> right? And maybe it's like that person, but it's like, yeah, that person in relation to you. And so just to see and feel and note the cost of self-clinging is such a huge part, right? Of getting clear on this path, right? And being able to get you know enough space that we can really hold others well. Um, okay, well, there's, well, next week we'll get into the full blown hell of insatiable desire. Okay. <laughs> That's really exciting. Um, but let, you can do your homework early if you want. <laughs> it's pretty illustrative, uh, just the, the theme. But let's give ourselves a moment to come back into our practice of settling in the body, settling the speech, settling the mind. And if it's comfortable placing hands at the heart in a gesture of offering and sharing. And considering the possibility of engaging with the Bodhisattva vow. To consider waking up this heart for the sake of all beings, all beings of all time, all beings as long as space remains. And may any, any benefit of our time here together any of the virtue and the energy that we've created and generated through our practice, we offer it all up. That each and every being of all time could know happiness and ease, could know their own beautiful divine nature, that each and every being could be completely and perfectly free. Thank you all so much. Love this juicy practice with you all.